And we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Self-Publishing Insiders. I am Jim Azevedo. I lead corporate communications here at Draft Digital. And today, it is my honor and my privilege to welcome with us John Kraska, the founder and uh, the founder and executive director of Every Library. Now, John, I'm I'm going to read through some of your background here and. You have such an interesting background, but I'm going to hit just some of the top level points here. So the uh, every library, uh, folks, if you haven't heard of every library, it is the first nationwide political action uh, political action committee for libraries, which John founded way back in 2012. John is also the co-author of Winning Elections and Influencing Politicians for Library Funding and Before the Ballot, Building Political Support for library funding. I also want to mention that um, in 2014, John was named a mover and shaker by the Library Journal. Anybody who is in the realm of libraries or who knows Library Journal knows that if you're named a mover and shaker, you're pretty much arrived. In 2022, John was named Chicagoan of the Year by the Chicago Tribune. What one and of what one of them? Jim, not 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 to suggest I was it. Just one of them. There was a group of us, but it was great. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> and then in 2023, you're named a notable by Publishers Weekly for your work opposing book bans and censorship. So, John, here we are in National Library Week. Thank you so much for joining us. Jim, you are, you are a very kind host, and your community is very warm and welcoming. I see in the chat already. Thank you, team. It's nice to be here. Uh, well, we're glad to have you here. Now, uh, John, uh, before we've got a lot to talk about today, and I'm so glad to see everybody in the comments section already. Uh, we've got some important things to discuss today, and I hope that our audience, you guys, when you're listening in, if you have any questions pop up, please add them to the comments section, and John and I will try to get to each and every single one of those. But we kind of, but before we dive into the nitty gritty, John, wanted to go over a few stats with you mm -hmm. uh, and our viewers here. So I thought I would lead off first by um, by mentioning a quote from Andrew Albanese from Publishers Weekly, who has been covering some of these stories around book challenges and book bans lately. <clears throat> and John says, quote, more than three years into a historic surge in attempted book bans, the organized political attack on libraries and the freedom to read continue to grow. Now, some stats here from the New York Times that I want to mention here. I think this was um, Alexander Alter or Elizabeth Harris, Harris from the New York Times who said, the number of unique titles targeted for censorship in 2023 surpassed 4,200, 4,200 titles, up by an astounding 65% over 2022. Now, get this. In the last 20 years, since the American Library Association's been tracking this stuff, prior to 2021, the average number of titles that were challenged um, in any given year was just 273. Mm -hmm. The highest number during that span, that's the span of the last, over the last 20 years, the highest number during that span was 393 in a single year. So if we add up all the challenged books during that time, during the last 20 years, it was just 3,637, which is over 600 fewer than were challenged in 2023 alone. So John, what's going on? What's happening out there? Jim, it is, the, um, it is a perfect storm. Uh, 20 years ago, there was no internet to organize people. Um, there were mm -hmm. attempts uh, to, to, to uh, see uh, either movements based on morality uh, movements based on on protection of of kids, mm -hmm. theoretically protection of kids, yep. movements that are anti free speech, uh, they all existed in silos from each other. There might have been a mimeograph or Xerox newsletter going around uh -huh. from some of these organizations if they were well organized. There might have been individual actors, but what we have now is a confluence of many different movements uh, that have come together uh, and have been given permission by political actors and been weaponized in many cases uh, as mm. politicized or performative activities uh, to go after these books. 
Uh, what we know very clearly from where we're sitting here at every library yeah. uh, is that these performative and politicized actions are intended to do, well, you have to understand where, where the attacks are coming from in order to respond properly. Yeah. Um, okay. they're, they're intended to do one of a couple of different things. One is to uh, use the book uh, censorship activity as, as really a form of discrimination. Uh, okay. uh, there are political actors out there who know very, very clearly that it's easier to go after a book than it is to go after a person or a group. Okay. And yet by saying something is obscene, which is one of the, the reasons that you can constantly you that up. Well, you know, remove something from the library, there's a big difference between unconstitutional censorship and constitutional censorship, which we get to later. Uh, but the idea that something is obscene, something is criminal, uh, is a way to label people whether it's anti-LGBTQ or anti-black and brown. Um, there's also uh, uses of um, um, censorship activity, uh, discrimination activity like this, that's intended to uh, discredit the profession of, of, of librarianship, to discredit the institution of public libraries, to go after educators. Um, and we see that not only in the book bans, but also some bills that have happened over the last two legislative sessions that would criminalize truly criminalize under under state state level obscenity laws educators um, that could be art teachers english teachers nurses school nurses uh, counselors school librarians uh, and or criminalize public libraries in one or two states they've tried to criminalize museums again you know this is like the 80s all over again when it came to yeah. the attacks on nea and neh and i mean these are not new jim but they're weaponized in ways, and they're able to be organized across uh, divides because of, I mean, if we were organizing a movement right now, we'd be on yeah. StreamYard together, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's true. So it, it, it's not just a few concerned mothers out there who are you know, carrying some torches around. This is a nationwide organized political movement. According to the, the research we've done, and our media partner most recently on some good survey work at the American public was uh, Book Riot, uh, who I'm sure that some of your, your network you know, spent some Absolutely. time with. Yeah, they're great. Uh, Kelly Jensen over there at Book Riot has done tremendous original reporting on, on this topic. And we did some original survey work where we asked parents, uh, Every Library Institute, which is our, our nonprofit side, Every Library, the political side, on our, on our mm -hmm. nonprofit side uh, with Book Riot, we asked American parents do, do you agree with these so-called moms for whatever, you know, the, the, the purple parents, the, the mantle of, of parental rights is, has been picked up and, and, and is, is being used as a cudgel uh, by these special interest groups. So we said, okay, parents, we asked thousands of parents. What, what, this what is across think? the entire country. Across the entire country. What do you think, feel, and believe about, about public libraries, school libraries, and, and librarianship? in relation to, to book bans and censorship. What, how does it impact the culture of reading? How does it impact the culture of learning? Um, somewhere between 16% uh, and 22% of parents came back and said that they're comfortable with some form of censorship. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is, to say that this is a, a totally fringe movement now, uh, three years into it, as Andrew's article you know, in Publishers Weekly said, yeah. um, Maybe if we'd asked that, that question three years ago, it would have been under 8%, under 7%. We asked that question two years ago, and it was only 12. You know, it's growing now. It's at least 16% of, of parents um, who are comfortable with the idea that the way that we protect our kids from something that's fairly abstract in many cases um, is by censoring or even criminalizing uh, the, the, uh, the culture of reading, the culture of learning through libraries and schools. It, it's it's flabbergasting to me, Jim, that we've gotten to this point. But I look yeah. at but I look at what's happened in, in the health space. You know, I look at I look health. at what what's happened uh, in the election administration space as well and, and don't think that we're somehow or another special or unique anymore. Wow. Why is obscenity such a key term? I mean and can you even define it in the first place? Can anybody define it what it means in, in a legal sense? So obscenity is a is a criminal uh, action. Uh, it is in okay. the criminal code in all 50 states. Uh, obscenity is defined really primarily at the state level when it comes to, to identifying what is obscene and distribution of obscene materials and things like that. It, it's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's in the criminal code, uh, along with in, at the federal level, uh, Title 18, largely around telecommunications. 
there hasn't been a federal prosecution in a generation uh, on obscenity, and that the obscenity cases that have been brought against books recently, um, there's two um, that have happened in the last 18 months. There was one in Virginia uh, where Barnes & Noble was being sued. And there was one in Michigan where a school district was being sued uh, specifically over obscenity allegations about certain certain key titles. Mm -hmm. In both of those cases, the judges, when, when an actual judge gets a chance to adjudicate these, these issues, actual judges say that these are not obscene. These are not criminally defined uh, titles. Sure. Virginia dismissed it out of hand. Uh, the Michigan case in Kent School District there, Kent County School District said no as well. Mm -hmm. There is a test for obscenity. Um, in, there is. Yeah, there is. Uh, the Supreme okay. Court. Um, Supreme Court put it together in 1973. It's it's been so common over the last 50 years that it's in the background, you know. Um, okay. But the test is called the Miller test, and the Miller test was was uh, based on a case, you know, like you hear about, um, you know, Roe v. Wade. That, 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 mm -hmm. that there's a case number, but the name is the Miller test. Okay. And Miller asks. Um, judges and juries to look at whether or not the, the book is obscene across three different definitions. Uh, one is about whether or not it's pervasively vulgar. Uh, the other yeah. is whether or not it violates current state law. And the third fundamentally is whether or not the, 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 the material in question, the book, the, the art, the movie, uh, has any artistic or literary merit. And on those three criteria, like I said, Judges, you know, prosecutors don't pick up the case. Judges, judges throw them out because you don't find risable to the definition of obscenity materials in public libraries or schools. They're, they're not collected. And while there's a lot of, of things that have adult themes, those aren't criminal. Adult mm -hmm. themes are not criminal behavior. Um, the right. definitions are, are, are there. They've been there since... I mean, in some states, the, the definitions around what's obscene have been there since the Kennedy administration, not just the, the latter part of the Nixon years, you know? Okay, yeah. I want to go back. I don't want to, like, just revisit what we talked about already, but I want to go back to the last three years in particular, mm -hmm. just because of that, of that spike. Yeah. And granted, uh, I 100% agree with you on the Internet and services like StreamYard and the ability to share information. Mm -hmm. But still, what... What's what's happened in the last three years in particular? Is it because we have an upcoming election? Yes. Um, is it a little bit oh, of everything? A little bit of everything. Uh, there's a, okay. there's, a move, there's been a historic movement to try and end sex ed and uh, the teaching of gender studies. And okay. gender and sex are, are key drivers. You'll see it in the, the PEN America data that we also help collect and support. Okay. Um, gender, uh, sex ed, the teaching mm -hmm. of sexuality, the idea that that you know our neighbors, uh, us who are gay or queer or trans, should exist, can exist, that that vector of attack um, has been has been taken to a new new extreme. Um, and the fact that there is an opportunity for politicians and political movements to um, go after a book and use it as a way to build their base. I mean the the the. the um, Virginia and Texas gubernatorial races in 2021 mm -hmm. rediscovered censorship as a way to, to build a campaign. Um, so they've was, seen that it's worked, that this is a political tool, weapon that's worked in the past. And that's right. they're going to they're gonna rip that page out of their play, out of the previous playbook and use it again. Yep. In 2023, the, the, the fellow who, who ran for governor of Louisiana and won, he was the current attorney general during his campaign. His first campaign uh, event to run for governor of the state of Louisiana, one of the 50 states in the United States of America, was to, was to publish a, a report called Protecting Innocence. There was a hit job on public libraries, um, made all sorts of allegations about criminal activity, and then put an asterisk on it saying it's not really criminal because it doesn't, it's not risable to the Miller test. And then he campaigned on it and won. won, won, won he's the governor of Louisiana right now. He had a tip line, Jim, that was set up so that citizens could report bad books at their libraries. Um, the fellow who's running for governor of um, Missouri right now, who's the current secretary of state, the, he's the state librarian, according to the Constitution yeah. of the state of Missouri. Um, he has, has promulgated um, um, 
rules that would be very restrictive on the right to read in, in public libraries uh, as a component of his campaign for governor. I mean, politicians and political actors. I mean, Jim, I run a political action committee for libraries. Yeah. I said that 15 minutes ago, you know, full disclosure. I mean, we're a political action committee for libraries. I, I mean, the, the First Amendment, the Constitution uh, and support for it lines up with our political agenda. The 14th Amendment, when it comes to pol to, to civil rights and uh, mm -hmm. equal protection, lines up with our agenda. If you're on the other side of those issues, I mean, you're going to want to find yeah. something that you can campaign on. And to say that our children somehow or another are being turned into criminals or monsters. I mean, there was a campaign in uh, Michigan uh, at the Patmos yeah. Library that your, your readers might be familiar with um, or your, mm -hmm. your listeners might be familiar with. The, the Patmos Library was on the ballot in the fall of 2022 to renew their basic funding levy. Um, and the campaign against the renewal, like the campaign to, to close the library, came from a group of frustrated book banners who said, and, I, and I'm quoting here, it's really yeah. disturbing, but I'm quoting here, get rid of the groomers and pedophiles, say no to the library. I mean, this, wow. this kind of rhetoric works in terms of motivating groups of, of, um, of politicized activists. Uh, it's tragic. Uh, that campaign, actually, they, they did lose. Uh, in in August of 2022, uh, they lost again in November of 2022. Uh, we were able to help in, in a couple of different ways. Actually, there's, there was some very, very good fundraising that was done across the li literary and library community. Um, Nora Roberts, for one, as mm -hmm. a, a big name, put in some, some um, serious support there. Yep. Uh, helped keep the library open. We spent a year, Jim, working on, on resetting the conversation in the community, de-escalating that, that hateful rhetoric. Um, talking to people about what they really believe about the right to read, and we were able to pass it in um, okay. November 2023. That library is going to stay open, but uh, John, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. No, but, but the fact that we've gotten to this point is is kind of amazing in America right now. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I mean, hopefully my jaw isn't on the desk right now because you're you're informing us about all these things that are happening today in 2024 and. I don't know. Hopefully, my mouth isn't agape or I'm constantly shaking my head. But well, it's hard to believe. I mean, are these folks? Are they just going after public libraries, or are they attacking schools at the elementary level as well? And yep, it's the higher on the higher education academic libraries too. Is it across the board? Yeah, the the cadence of of um, I want to answer your question accurately in in a couple of different ways. One is that okay. the K twelve environment. Schools are, are actually more under attack than, than public libraries are. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the school side as well with education alliances, like we do with uh, local public library alliances. Yep. Um, but on the school side, the, the cadence of attacks against the right to read, the attacks against students um, for mm -hmm. their identity, uh, for their humanity, uh, the, the attacks against teachers and other education uh, professionals, as well as the structure of public education, cannot be understated, Jim. It's it's an extraordinary moment um, when they're going after the, the future of public education, as well as the dignity of, of those students and their ability to, to read stories about themselves and get accurate information. On the public library side, it's, it's happening all the time. On the academic library side, it's growing. Um, there are, uh, the, the academy is not immune. From what's happening okay. in the rest of society and it's very important for for folks who are involved in higher ed and in academic libraries um, to be uh, more than vigilant uh, to be active about why uh, the first amendment on campus uh, is so important um, and uh, why the, um, the the culture of learning the the opportunities for scholarship are so necessary to have without okay. a fear or favor based approach to collections John, what would you say to somebody like me? I'm I'm out here in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. and somebody like me might say, "Well, you know, that that stuff's happening in the Deep South, or that would never happen here." Um, what would you say to someone like that? Well, if you... it sounds like this is spreading. So the if you're truly in a in a place that's not experiencing the problems then what we need is your help with other places. 
You know, okay. uh, this is a, a situation that if you believe, uh, like we do, that the, the right to read is, is, a, is a key element of, of society, uh, mm -hmm. de democratic society, civil society, yeah. the progressive ideals, then joining it in with an organization like every library uh, or another uh, anti-censorship group, I think is important. Um, we put to work our value system right now in a couple of key ways that we help. We hope people who, who can join us can do. We have a, 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 a platform called Fight for the First. Uh, okay. Fightforthefirst.org is a, uh, it's basically change.org for libraries. You know, we, we've set this up so that if there's a problem, thank you for putting that up, there's a problem uh, in a local community Somebody can can say we have a problem. We'd like some some assistance. Here's what our problem looks like. We can platform mm -hmm. that call to actions very quickly. What we do is uh, train, coach, and guide and support the good people who are in that community, who want to stand with either the library or for the First Amendment, depending on how things are going. Yeah. Um, and then we need folks who are outside of the zone. You know, if you're in it, man. If you're in if you're in the trenches on this, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's hard. It is, uh, it's community organizing, it's union organizing, it's the, the fights are akin to the anti-nuclear, you know, uh, reproductive justice, um, you know, civil rights fights. I mean, these, these people are in it. Yeah. So if you're outside of that zone, what we do as a national organization is we put money to work from donors, from vendor donors, individual donors. We have kind of a Bernie Sanders model for our donor base. And we help them, we help them help make their voice heard. Uh, we spend money on every single campaign advertising on social. Um, nothing goes viral anymore. You know, if anybody's doing marketing knows, you got to be able to put that out in front of folks, you know? Yeah. Um, and we, we show up. We, we show up uh, sometimes with uh, direct donations. Right now we're doing a, a fundraising drive in Prattville, Alabama, where the, mm -hmm. the library director and four members of the staff quit rather than implement unconstitutional bigoted yeah. policies on the part of that library board. I mean, th these, wow. this is how we do it when there's, when, when you're in a, when you're in a green zone, like, like a San mm -hmm. Francisco, mm -hmm. if you're in a hot zone though, like a Prattville, what you can do if you haven't, if you're just coming around to understanding this situation is again, a fight for the first kind of flight framework, yep. join in, you know, join in. We've got opportunities for people to articulate, you know, a, a value system when it comes to the watchdog work. We've got our opportunities for people to be guard dogs for the First Amendment, and for the library, and for the schools. That's okay. really, you know, hardcore activism. Um, yeah. there's, there's a chance for people to bird dog this digitally. I mean, Jim, we're trying to give them different pathways to to put their. Yeah, their it sounds like you're, you've you've got work. a ton of resources out there. If somebody wanted to organize um, a group or a committee, they mm -hmm. can come to you. They can come to every library and mm -hmm. just ask for some help, and you'll say, okay, well. Mm -hmm. Here are some resources. Do you mm -hmm. need us to come out and, and train your people? Yep. That's us. That's I mean, that, that, that's exactly what we do. And we've been doing that for 12 years in different ways. We started off, as you as you mentioned before, doing local library ballot measures. Mm -hmm. We've done this uh, in defense of school librarian jobs. Yep. We do this all the time on negotiations with city councils and county governments on library funding and school board funding. Yep. Uh, and this one on, on the fight for the first, I mean, it's not just the First Amendment freedom, freedom of speech issues, though, by the way. It's a whole cloth approach to the First Amendment. Uh, the right to petition is very important. Um, the right to assemble yeah. uh, and the right to be heard to your government is absolutely necessary. Uh, freedom of and from religion. Uh, we're trying to work in, in support of, um, of public libraries as part of the public sphere uh, in what's uh, essentially a, a very evolving space around religion in the public sphere. Um, and the freedom of the press and the transparency issues. I mean, we're, we are approaching this. I'm not saying just the freedom of speech. It's foundational. Yeah. Um, but also from that civil rights perspective as well. Because if we see censorship as a form of erasure and discrimination, then we have to act against it in an anti-discriminatory way. Yeah. I mean, if it's going to be systemic on the discrimination side, then it's got to be systemic and organized mm -hmm. on the fight back. That's right. So yeah, we're actually working in a couple of states right now on uh, new legislation uh, that would support um, public libraries primarily. Uh, schools on civil rights is is a is a different framework, and it's a that's a whole other episode of this. Um, but the uh, the idea uh, within uh, model legislation that we help produce called the 
Libraries for All Act. Uh, Delaware has a has a version of it right now that's just passed the House or in the Senate. There's a version of it that's embedded in Vermont uh, legislation. There's several other states that we've helped advise on this, and a few other states mm -hmm. that we haven't who are also doing this. Um, where how can we utilize uh, civil rights protections, public accommodation laws, mm -hmm. as a justification for bringing materials into a public library? The First Amendment really is about what can we keep. And you can keep things that are not criminal. But why do we bring it in the library in the first place? What, why do we bring it in the library in the first place? Is often that it's interesting to the majority. Yep. You know, it's comfortable yep. to the majority. But what happens when we are looking at a book, say, about a family with two same-sex parents, and it's it's yep. a, it's, a, it's a family story. That book is is about a family that's legal. Mm -hmm. You know, we're post-gay marriage in this society. Okay, yeah. interracial marriage. I mean, let's just talk about families for a minute. That, yeah. that we're we're in a society that um, is it, where these are legal humans and arrangements yes. of humans. Okay, so the books that we have should not just be comfortable to the majority, but they should be relevant to those protected minority classes under civil sure. rights law. And I think it's a revolutionary approach, Jim. Um, I'm glad to see a couple of states are, are considering it because what we don't need to do with our right to read laws is weaponize the First Amendment against itself. You know, I'm not interested yeah. in seeing more ban book by ban, but ban book bans by banning book bans bill. It's, those are, how, how do we affirm the dignity of the writer and the reader yes. in that conversation? Wow. And John, I mean, we've kind of touched upon, upon the, the themes and the topics that continuously are being discriminated against or mm -hmm. are continuously are being challenged. But can you run through some of those again, just to make sure that we're not leaving any particular group out? Sure. Uh, well, we see anti-LGBTQ um, yeah. plus. Year in and year out. I'm year in and year out. Um, the um, the, the movement around uh, don't say gay, you know, is manifest in, in censorship and discrimination. Um, same way uh, an, an anti-CRT, rhetorically anti-CRT, is anti-black and brown and communities of color. The, the history of race and racial uh, unrest and animosity in this country is a source of grave shame. And so we'd rather censor it than, than deal with it, you know? It's never happened. No, it never <laughs> happened. Yeah, the, so the, um, and um, issues of, of um, um, anti-public sector work, uh, anti-education are the censorship activity might be about a book that's been around for ever, you know, like yeah. it's the kill a mockingbird type books The it's the, I mean, Walter, the farting dog, which is a classic as far as I'm concerned, you know, yeah. the, <laughs> these books, they're, they're not going after that for any other reason than to discredit educators and education librarians and public libraries. I think we've all seen titles that we've read in high school or, or even college where we're like, what? Like, how Absolutely. could you possibly ban that book? Absolutely. So the, the, those different vectors of attack together, we have to remind ourselves that there's also a, a movement um, that is, again, trying to eliminate the teaching of sex ed in schools and gender studies. Um, it is very mm -hmm. conservative. It is morally driven. And I don't understand why you'd want to have children not know who they are. You know, yeah. So, uh, and you take all that together with the politicized and performative and um, uh, book attacks that are really just used to, to rile up the base. You know, yeah. we, we we see that every presidential cycle, we see that every gubernatorial cycle where there's a fight going on. Um, that kind of pernicious politics uh, should have no place in education or in public libraries. Wow. Wow. John, is it just the books that are in danger, or are we talking about librarians, like people who are also in harm's way? Um, maybe <clears throat> libraries are being vandalized, and are librarians in danger? I mean, have there been attacks on people? Um, there have been uh, a tremendous uptick in threats to both the institution and the humans who work there on the public library side. Um, there's always a threat matrix in, in K-12 uh, and and being a teacher today in America is very difficult. Being a lot school librarian in, in America right now um, is very difficult, but the, the attacks um, have not been, to, 
th th there's a case here or there where there's been some graffiti work or some defacement. Uh, there have been situations where a, a colleague of, of mine uh, went to the book uh, drop in the morning, one morning, uh, in the American West. Let's just say that. Um, okay. It's not all in the South, Jim. It's not all in the West either. It's happening everywhere. Um, but went to the book the book drop bin and, and open it up, and there was uh, uh, several books that had been shot with a shotgun. Okay. Yeah. Um, the number of bomb threats that have been lodged against libraries, uh, we're, we're working on some tracking right now around that. Uh, this is not unusual for the public sector. Um, unfortunately, uh, at, uh, again, election administration, election, you know, clerks of elections, they're feeling it. Um, on the health side, uh, social workers, I mean, the idea that there's been some level of permission to, to make these yeah. kinds of, of personal or terroristic threats against public sector workers. Uh, and again, public sector workers, you know, public librarians are public sector workers. Uh, school, school libraries are educators. The fact that there's been permission given by our political leaders from certain circles uh, to go after these people and these institutions um, is a return to a kind of, of um, domestic violence, a, 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 a civil violence that I think it needs to be addressed in very, very strong ways by law enforcement. Uh, it needs to be addressed in very strong ways by groups like the ATF and the FBI. I mean, this, this should not be taken lightly. Uh, we do not I need, just, we don't need this to be escalated. I, I just want, well, this is probably is the conversation for this, but I personally, I just want to understand why, like, I just, I don't get it. Maybe it's, um, I want to understand from a compassionate perspective, like why are some of these groups feeling threatened? Um, I took my little girl, you know, during pride to go to a reading, you know, go to one of the drag readings. It mm -hmm. was a blast. She had a lot of fun. I think no she was only three or four years old at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember the reader asked, asked, you know, do any little girls or little boys in here have two mommies or two daddies? And, you know, mm -hmm. some hands went up mm -hmm. and I'll never forget my little girl turned around and she looked at me and she looked at the, at the reader and said, well, I only have one mommy and one daddy. And it was so cute and so innocent. Mm -hmm. But then I think about some other communities who are trying to educate their young, but then they get, um, you know, the proud boys or somebody will come in and burst through the doors and mm -hmm. and try to end those types of educational events. And it, it just blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, the, the tour for a drag queen story time in San Francisco is, is a lot um, easier, perhaps, than some other parts, you know, parts of sure. uh, of America, and uh, for a library to 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 do a drag queen story time spontaneously without any preparation for its community might actually not be a smart move. Um, it takes some time to have those conversations. If the uh, if the um, from a safety perspective, yeah, from safety, but also from from a a, a, a community identity perspective, okay. um, the if a drag queen story time is you know, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, San Francisco, you know, I've, I've been to all kinds of different things when I visited San Francisco. It's great fun, you know, Yeah. Um, but there's some communities where the only gay person that somebody might know was somebody's nephew who left town when he graduated high school, you know? Yeah. So I, I have to say that, that there are times when the library community might be pushing the envelope a little bit more than it needs to in certain places uh, or, or too quickly. How do we have hmm. a dialogue about, about, neighborliness how do we have a, a dialogue about live and let live how do we how do we have yeah. a dialogue about the fact this is a public library and not a not a sacred space or a church community um those kinds of dialogues have to happen in america that's a um, really interesting perspective especially from where you sit mm -hmm. well i mean we're 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 interested in uh programming that not only edifies but also challenges and mm -hmm. edification's nice but edification is just comfort yeah let's challenge ourselves but having those discussions about where do we start from with this local place i'm not admonishing anybody who's put one on before but i think yeah. we've, we we might have been surprised about how uncomfortable most of america is um and let's how do we move through through dialogue and discussion through through the the the, the action of reading the action of writing the action of sharing um how do we move in, into understanding and empathy i love it and i I'm the first to admit that I might be taking it for granted, given where I where I live. Where oh, and I'm not I'm not pushing back on you at all, man. Let's go. Oh, we'll I understand. Have a good time, you know. 
<laughs> I want to bring up this comment because it reminds me of a question that I meant to ask you earlier. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie, thank you for your comment. She says, I may be in Sweden, but I'm all for fighting for the rights of authors in the US to be able to write what they want and have the books in all shops and libraries without restriction. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that comment, Natalie. And I, I brought it up because is, is this problem of challenges and censorship, I'm sure it's not just a domestic problem here in the US. Um, how widespread across the globe is it? We're seeing um, a, the, the United States um, either is a leading exporter or we're in dialogue with other nationalistic groups um, or other special interest groups uh, uh, in, in other countries. And there's a circle, you know, there's a feedback circle. I look at, I look at um, Reagan and Thatcher, okay, just as a, as mm -hmm. a political example. They, they, they helped each other become better at their particular brand of, of conservatism. The same way Clinton and Blair had a virtuous circle about their ah. version of progressivism. We okay. see uh, we see in the States an, either a, a mode of exporting going on to Canada um, and uh, Ireland and um, some other parts of, of Western democracies where the techniques of individuals who have strong concerns around parental control or parental oversight, uh, they have strong concerns about morality. Um, mm -hmm. They've learned from the American playbook. Um, and wow. so we're exporting some of those ideas to some of these other countries. Ireland in particular, the public libraries are, are under siege there right now. They're handling it, I think, uh, better than we have in the States. Uh, perhaps they've, they've, they've learned a little bit from us, but I don't think so. I think that the, the uh, framework around human rights and civil rights in, uh, and the right to read in the EU is much more um, uh, focused on, on human beings than, than in the United States, which is focused on laws not being made. Um, mm -hmm. But if we're also looking at this as a, as a, a feedback cycle and a, and a loop, um, there are authoritarian regimes in the West, like in, in, I mean, Hungary, for example, where we, I think, have learned from them uh, about how to utilize these wedge issues around identity politics. Um, the idea that there, there should be um, no unconstitutional censorship in the public sphere is, is, not, is not uniquely American. Um, but the particulars of how it's done in America or on the First Amendment and around due process issues um, is. I, I wouldn't count, counsel anyone living outside of the United States to follow the U.S. Uh, First Amendment playbook because it's not applicable under your, your, your local laws. Um, that said, the, the, um, the opportunity to see the lowest number of barriers to free expression, both as a writer uh, as well mm -hmm. as, a, as a reader, I think is is what really distinguishes um, functioning democracies in the West from other kinds Absolutely. of authoritarian regimes. Fantastic comment. You know, we're quite lucky here uh, to be on the front lines of the this democratization of publishing. You know, mm -hmm. with with what we do here at Drafted Digital, yep. and we've been able to, to witness this tsunami of diverse voices kind of flood the entire industry, and we're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. um, so what can our what can our community do? What can indie authors and publishers do um, themselves within their communities? Mm -hmm. uh, what can they do with their reading communities, with their mm -hmm. fans to help protect themselves and their fellow authors? Sure. So if you're in a hot zone and you have the uh, the ability and the agency <laughs> and the liberty to do this yourself, because not everybody does. Okay, not everybody can 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 become an activist. But if there is something going on in your neck of the woods and you can stick your neck out, let's do it. You know, uh, having authors uh, and writers and creators and the creative economy show up to these conversations, whether it's in a particular place saying, I'm from here too. This is why I write. This is what yep. I'm writing about. These are the humans I'm writing about. Um, and at the state level where there are fights around uh, legislation and policy as well to say, hey, I'm a hometown author. You know, I'm a, I'm a home state author. If you if you have um, a legitimate voice, you need to, to, to speak it. And so, you know, we can help uh, make some of those connections, some of those pathways happen on these kind of campaigns. There's other organizations out there that, that spend more time with authors directly than we do. But, but if you're in a green zone, a space where there's less heat, describing, um, talking not just about your own work, and mm -hmm. I know we're all generous here on this call, don't get me wrong, 
Um, but not just your own work, but the culture of reading, the culture of writing, the culture of creativity, the idea that that um, uh, books and literature and movies and, and other creative forms of expression exist um, within the human condition of a civil society. You know, describing that to folks who uh, might not be readers themselves without yeah. challenging them to become a reader. Um, describing one of the things we try and do with, on That's every library point. here, I mean, we're, we're not trying to make people into users. We're, we're trying to meet people uh, who want to be supporters and talk about why support is necessary for these institutions and these people who work there. Um, we don't require anybody to change their lifestyle to become a, a user of the library, nor should we have a litmus test about people uh, being more meritorious for being readers. They can consent. I mean, we, we run a we help support a, a big survey every six months in the United States called the Freckle Project. The Freckle, uh, the Freckle Project, Project um, asks a key question of American readers, which is, where did you get that book? And that, that answer is fascinating. You can get it on our Every Library Institute uh, site mm -hmm. uh, under our research tab. Where did you get that book? But we know that you know Americans, util nine out of 10 Americans utilize either for reading for pleasure, reading for work, reading for, for answers, um, mostly reading for pleasure. Nine out of 10 of us do it every year, every day, every month, you know? Um, yep. So talking about the, 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 the joy of being a writer, the dignity of being a writer, I mean, those are absolutely necessary uh, because we have to remind people it's not just all censorship. Yeah. And that th there is something transformational about not just writing, but reading. 100%, that's beautiful. Um, let's say that I am in a, in a zone that's a bit more difficult. Sure. How do I how do I start? Uh, maybe maybe I'm a little afraid to to make my voice heard. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to start? So they should I come to everylibrary.org and yeah, well, I mean, we, there, we we currently we just put up our ninety uh, eighth no sorry eighty ninth eighty ninth um, fight for the first <laughs> campaign at a local level. It's it, sometimes it's one zip code. And Jim, it's, it's it's I mean sometimes it's countywide. We have a few state organizations that we support, and uh, yeah, uh, the Florida Freedom to Read Project, the Texas Freedom to Read Project, Alabama Read Freely, are are yeah. some some of those. Um, yeah, we would be happy to make connections. Um, there is some strength in numbers here that that should not be underappreciated. There's solidarity that happens, um, and if if somebody's in a hot zone and they're like, you know, I I would do this if if asked, I'm asking you now. Um, you know, wow. this is the time that, you know, if, if you're looking around and like, why doesn't anybody else, we, we'd be happy to stand with you. Um, we can onboard a campaign in a crisis situation or even in an inoculation situation. You know, mm -hmm. not, not everything's a hot zone. Sometimes you, you, you know, it's coming. Let's, let's get ahead of it. Yeah. We, yeah. We can get you up and running in five, 10 minutes. We'd be happy. Are you talking from an individual point yeah. of view or yeah. from a live like let's say I'm, I'm a librarian and a librarian can go here as, as well and say well i've got me and three or four of my fellow librarians and we're concerned um the librarians themselves yes but the majority of i mean we're, we're almost at 100 campaigns the majority are, are humans who care they're, they're, they're civilians if i may you know okay it's, yeah it's it's parents it's um concerned citizens it's uh, everyday folks. It's writers. Um, it is. It's people who are in, who are affected personally, but also people who are compassionately engaged, or or yeah. or engaged with some of the issues around the law. And there's a lot of different reasons to come to a fight. Um, yeah. And we we will be very happy to take the First Amendment fans, the uh, the folks who are defending their own dignity or the dignity of their neighbors and family, uh, or folks who just don't want to see the whole place burned down. I mean, right. civil, civil society here, Jim, is a big deal. Um, you know, what's my hometown supposed to be like? What kind of country are we supposed to be living in? Absolutely. And I get the sense from talking with you, John, is that, hey, everything, I'm in a green zone, la-di-da, everything's fine here. I don't have to get involved. But after spending the last 45 minutes with you, it's like, no, you, I can't stay quiet on this stuff when I've got friends and colleagues in other part of the country mm -hmm. who are exactly the folks who are being targeted mm -hmm. um 
Well, yeah. a good place to get started if you're in a green zone um, as such, uh, maybe you're maybe you're accidentally not. Um, if you don't mind, Jim, can you put the, the action uh, dot sure. everlibrary.org URL? Yeah. Uh, we have Fight for the First, which is very much these tactical campaigns. The Sorry. Correct one? The, nope. The action dot everlibrary.org one. Come on, Jim. Oh, don't worry. You're cool. So, folks, it's action dot <laughs> everlibrary.org. Uh, so we work with a number of state library associations as well as other state statewide actors like these uh, freedom read groups. You can hit the, this homepage here and scroll down and you'll see that there are state level actions that, that are happening uh, that are focused on legislators. You know, the House and the Senate in a lot of places are mm -hmm. broken. Um, and we've got several things happening in Congress. So okay. if you want to just kind of dip your toe in, um, we've got ways to make your voice heard. Uh, without having to to become an activist, uh, this is not slacktivism, mind you. This is legitimate. It's it's going out and saying to a member of Congress, a member of state legislature, uh, please uh, fix a problem. Uh, please prevent a problem. Uh, both of those are, are are ways to make your voice heard. Fantastic. Um, I I knew this was going to happen, and I say this every week. We, the conversation went by so quickly. We're already at time. Uh, but John, I mean, we don't have to stop right this second, but I want to ask you, is there anything else that you want to make sure that our viewers understand when it comes to book challenges, book bans, and, and, and censorship? Sure. Uh, as, um, <clears throat> as it goes uh, right now, the, the, I think we need to, to re-engage across libraries and across education uh, with the independent booksellers, uh, the independent book publishers, and the independent authors community. Um, the, the, the conversation around what's the role of, of reading, how does the creative economy work, uh, what is the, the hope for outcomes of, of reading in mm -hmm. a very distracted digital age. You know, the, the, the things that we've been seeing uh, in terms of format changes, um, are not a problem. You know, the, the move to eBooks uh, is a democratizing force in the marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a democratizing force in the ability for readers to access wide range of, of, of different writers uh, and publishers. Uh, these are good things. You know, the, the movement away from from only print into digital is something that I think a lot of the the, the library community is, is very invested in. There's some policy issues around it um, that are not just specific to a, a censorship conversation today. There's there's fundamental issues around around ownership uh, and around the right uh, the, the the right to lend. Um, you know, if we have uh, uh, e-books where um, you can only, I mean, I look at I look at at, at e-books as being one of the 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 new states of matter. You know, like in, in, in high school, we learned about, you know, gases and solids and liquids. And, and then we learned about plasma at some point. We're like, holy cow, there's plasma too. There's also ebooks. Because of the way that the law is set up, um, the reason that the public libraries exist um, is because of two things. One is um, public tech, a, a progressive tax policy that funds the common good. You know, do we want to put tax dollars to work? on things as prosaic as libraries or parks or, you know, sewers, you know, like just mm -hmm. like, how do we want to tax ourselves? The other reason that public libraries exist is because of the right to lend and the right to lend as a component of the creative economy. The fact that libraries can buy um, books, print books, but can't always buy digital. I mean, I think we have to have that conversation. Uh, because without the right to lend, we we really lose a, a a core component. I mean, copyrights in the Constitution. I believe that copyright is as a const. I mean, if we're going to talk about the First Amendment, let's talk about Article One, section Section Eight, Clause Eight. You know, those big right. policy fights, Jim. I think need to be engaged by public libraries and independent authors and publishers with the same kind of veracity that we're engaging th this conversation about First Amendment, because there could be curbs, constitutional curbs, unconstitutional curbs about our right to read, but if we could never get to it in the first place, 
if we can never get to to that creativity that your your community is is so interested in expressing, if we can yeah. never get to it as libraries, then the censorship conversation is actually moot. You know, how and do we're we... not powerless, and we are not powerless as no, you have not. proven. Yes, absolutely. It's it's twenty five to thirty percent of the marketplace. It's a marketplace of ideas, yes, but let's get let's. I'd like to. I know plenty of librarians out there who'd like to buy more stuff. Yeah, and I know plenty of people who are in the audience right now who probably have four or five or more library apps on their phones. That's right. Who ingest a book a week, if not more. That's right. Sometimes a book. Sometimes it's a book a day. So yeah. we're all in this together. Yep. That's so not, I mean, that's I, not... if if the creative economy is is uh, to succeed, we need as low barrier as possible to to publishing and to reading. Hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Behind you, all the way. Cool. Uh, we are unfortunately at time. No, we really uh, are. Gosh, yes. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you, John, again, sincerely for spending some time with us today. We really appreciate you and what you're doing. Uh, I want to tell our audience that, as I remind you every week, if you could please like, share, comment, and subscribe to Self Publishing Insiders, we would appreciate that, so that we can get experts and advocates like John and his organization come in, to come and join us. Mm -hmm. um, also, folks, if you wouldn't mind, be sure to bookmark dddlive.com so you can see every week who our guest is going to be and what the topic of discussion is going to be. And then finally, for those of you who may be dipping your toes into the self-publishing waters for the first time, you can sign up for a free account at drafttodigital.com to learn more about self-publishing and where we will distribute your books into, including lots and lots of libraries that distribute your books into public libraries around the globe. Uh, John, if you wouldn't mind, hang out with me for a few more seconds here. If you can mm -hmm. kick back back in the green room. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to play a quick 30-second uh, commercial spot for DDD Print. It's our print-on-demand book publishing service. And to your, your community, if I can say thank you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Well, we're so glad you're here, John, and everybody else out there. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you again next week. And John, thanks a million to you once more. Ebooks really are great, your time but there's today. just something about having your words in print. Something you can hold in your hands, put on a shelf, sign for a reader. That's why we created D2D Print, a print on demand service that was built for you. We have free, beautiful templates to give your book a pro look, and we can even convert your ebook cover into a full wraparound cover for print. So many options for you and your books. And you can get started right now at draft2digital.com. <laughs>